It, it is a tremendous privilege for, uh, for me and Brother Leiter to be here with you. A tremendous privilege. And um, I've been given sort of a kind of an insurmountable or difficult task of take an hour and preach everything that ought to be preached on a biblical church. And, and I think it would take much longer than an hour. Um, but we're going to look at a few things about... Huh? Oh, well, be careful with that kind of statement. You may regret it. Um, but we're going to talk about about church. And if you're here tonight, you're probably here because you have an uneasiness, a restlessness about the way things are, about the, the spiritual uh, decline in your country, in Europe, as well as America, looking for something, looking for something. Well, let me just share with you. There are a lot of people and a lot of movements that can give you something. There are all sorts of things going on in Christianity today. It looks like a circus. A circus offering certain aspects of Christianity, certain power, certain joy, certain life, so many things, so many gimmicks, so many promises. Healing. Prosperity. Life as you want it, your best life now, absolutely everything is laid before you. What Jesus Christ lays before you is this. The promise of eternal life and a cross. What Jesus Christ lays before you is what really matters. And that is a character conformed to his image. The writers of the New Testament, although they speak quite frequently about all the blessings that God can pour out on a man. And the full counsel of Scripture tells us that, that the blessings of God are many. But for those who have come to know Christ, I think they have settled it in their heart that every blessing other than conformity of, to Christ is a lesser blessing. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be conformed to his will and not just in some extravagant religious way. I want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ in my personal relationship with God the Father. And I want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ in the relationships in my life, especially the most intimate. Now, I bring this up because it is so very important to me. I was preaching several years ago in Austin, Texas, and after I finished my first sermon, this pulpit committee, it's a committee in the church that's looking for a new pastor. It came up to me and it said, uh, would you be our pastor? I said, what? They said, w would you consider being our pastor? And I looked at them and I said, are you crazy? And they said, why do you say that? I said, you don't know if I love my wife or not. The point that I was making is, you know nothing about me. The devil preaches well. But true Christianity is seen in the life, the hidden life of a man, of a woman. And the dying to self and the giving oneself away in the name of Christ to God the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit and giving that life to others. We hear a lot of talk today about doing everything for the glory of God, and that's true. It's a true statement. But I'm afraid we sometimes use it to forget the second command. The first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself in sacrificial, joyful service. So the Christianity that I'm talking about tonight is not some gigantic 
religious show in a coliseum. It's not about you getting your best life now, the car you want, the house you want, or perfect health. What it's about is this. Is knowing God the Father and knowing Jesus Christ whom He has sent and being conformed to His image. What joy to be able, just think about this, to be able to love as he loves. To be able to represent him. Just to know him. That's Christianity. Now, we're going to talk a bit about. About church. About church. Most of us have this ecclesiastical organizational idea of church. We think of buildings with steeples on top of them and crosses on top of the steeples. We think of beautiful lawns. We think of old men preaching very boring messages. We think of all sorts of things when we think about church, but we need to understand what church truly is. It's none of that. Church is not so much an organization as it is an organism. It is a living entity. It is a creation of God through His Son and for His Son. It is relational. Now I want you to keep that word in the forefront of your mind. It is relational. Church, like your own personal life, is about a relationship with God and a relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, it's all about relationship. It's all about that. There's so much that's done dressed in religious garb, but it really has so little meaning. God has called us into a relationship with Himself. He's done that as we are individuals. He's done that collectively as a body. And God has called us to be in relationship with one another. To love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so the first thing I want you to see is that when we talk about church, we're talking about an organism. Something organic in nature. Now, there are two passages of Scripture, and we're not going to spend much time there at all because we've, we're going to look at several things tonight. But just for a moment, I want you to go to Jeremiah, and I want you to see the origin of the church, its divine origin. Jeremiah chapter 31, just quickly. Now, if you look in verse 31 of Jeremiah 31, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Now, the first thing I want you to understand is something about the nation of Israel. Do you honestly believe that everyone who came out of Egypt, led by Moses, was a believer? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, the great majority of them were idolaters. They were worshiping goat gods, demon gods, all sorts of things, even in the desert as they're being led around by God. We're, we're looking at basically a physical nation that was called out of Egypt. They were of the blood of Abraham, but most of them did not have faith. That's why they died in the wilderness. All right. So they were a, basically a carnal nation doing carnal things who had to be subdued by laws and authorities and this and that. They had to be subdued in a sense by the whip. 
in order to keep them in line. And why is that? Because their hearts had not been changed. Now, I want you to think about something for a moment. Most churches, most churches today are that way. Filled with a group of people whose hearts have not been changed. And pastors spend a great deal of their time doing what? Trying to motivate, manipulate, push, shove, coerce. Throwing all sorts of little parties and all sorts of little gimmicks and this and that and so many other things just to try to keep a group of people together in Jesus name. Behold the power of the gospel, not much gospel power manifested there, is it? Countless people identified in this country, in my country, with some denomination or some church, but it has no power, no sway over their life whatsoever. Nothing. The true church is not that way. Your ideas of church as a building, as an ecclesiastical organizational structure of half-hearted people attending and having to be held together by manipulation and coercion and gimmicks. That is not the church. Now he's going to tell us what the church is like. Look what he says. He says in verse 33, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws within them. And on their heart I will write it. Now, you must understand God is not speaking here poetically. Now, why do I say that? Because sometimes we hear such beautiful things in Scripture and we say, oh, that's nice, but we're not considering what he's saying. He's saying in the church, through the coming of the Messiah, he is going to create a new people. And they're not going to be a group of people who merely have some tablets of stone that they look at and disobey. He's going to create a group of people and he's going to transform their heart and he's going to put his will, his laws, his desires in their heart. Do you see that? They're going to be changed. And I use the word desire. I know it can be sort of dangerous, but there's a reason for it. When I say he puts his laws in your heart, you can still have this mechanical idea that, yes, those laws are in there and I must obey them. But when I say desires, he's not just revealing his will to you. He's changing your heart so that his will is your will and you desire to do what he desires. That's why John writes in his epistle that the commandments of God to the people of God are not burdensome. They desire these things. You see that? That's what the church is. He goes on and he says, I will put my laws within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. All throughout the Old Testament, there's this impassioned longing that we see in the words coming out of the mouth of God in which he is constantly saying, looking forward to the future, one day they will be my people. I will be their God. I will have a people on this earth and I will be that people's God. That time came with the coming of Christ. Through his death and resurrection, through the work of the Holy Spirit, God has created for himself a people. Now, they are not a people who have simply turned over a new leaf. They are not a people who have simply decided that they want to live a higher lifestyle. They are not a people who just one day decided we're going to change and be better. No, they are a people upon whom God has acted in his own power. He has transformed them. Now, are you that people? Do you know, I still, as we all, I struggle with many failures, many weaknesses. 
many struggles in the Christian life. But there is no doubt. The witness, my own, the people around me and the people who knew me 25 years ago. This this guy is not even the same person that I knew. I mean, I know my desires have changed. I mean, one day just going from let's go party, let's get in a fight if we can, let's chase women, let's get drunk, let's do this, to the very next day, I don't want to do all that anymore. What's happened to me? I want Christ. I want to know Him. I want to please God and be pleasing to God. Do you know that as a reality in your own life? Is your religion something that you're just trying to do the right thing? Or has Christ transformed you so that you want to know him? You want to do his will. You delight to do his will. I mean, what's happened to you? Brother Leiter says quite often that most people's Christianity is basically this. They're trying to do all the good things they hate in order to please God. That's not Christianity. That's not Christianity. Christianity is when I I want to do this. And you're not sad because you look at the will of God and think I have to do that. You're sad when you look at the will of God and realize you've fallen short. The burden doesn't come from obedience. The burden comes when we see we've disobeyed. Why? We're transformed. We're new creatures. We're saints of God. We're children of God. We're sons of the living God. We're led of the Spirit. Do you see? When he says new creature, when he says I will write it on their heart, he's not speaking metaphorically. To the, to the point where it no longer has meaning. He's not speaking poetically, so it's just some beautiful nonsense. No, when a person is saved, they become a new creature. That is what the church is made up of. Now, he says this, They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. Now, it's not saying that in the church there won't be teachers and pastors and evangelists and so on. But what he's saying is. The people of Israel. Although they saw these magnificent manifestations of God, they didn't understand them. I mean, they could see God part the water and then go worship a goat idol. They could see fire coming down from heaven and then make a golden calf. They didn't understand in in witnessing to people. And I know many of you have had the same experience. You, You pour your heart out to someone about the grace of God and they don't comprehend at all. At all. Like you sit there and you go, someone says, you, are, sir, are you going to go to heaven when you die? Oh, yes, I'm going to go to heaven. Why do you think so? Well, I'm a good man. I'm a good man. And so you go through for the next 20 minutes every scripture in the Bible that explains he is a wretched beast under the wrath of God. He says yes to every one of the verses. And then when you say, sir, are you going to go to heaven? Yes. Why? I'm a good man. Now, that's where you would be. Do you understand that? Your darkness would be to that extent and even worse. But what's happened? This passage. This passage. He has taught you. They shall be taught of God. He himself illumined your mind. And changed your heart. So many people walking around, especially these TV evangelists. I think we ought to put most of them on a boat and just ship them somewhere to an island where there's no people. 
But they're saying, yeah, supernatural nature of Christianity, the supernatural this and the supernatural that. Supernatural? There is more of the supernatural power of God manifested in the regeneration of a single heart than in the creation of the universe itself. Supernatural. We're not marveling at what's truly supernatural. Say, well, Brother Paul, do you believe God can heal people? I have seen God heal people in the mountains where there were no doctors. Not frequently, but according to his will, his plan, his purpose. But I want to tell you something. I did not get excited in comparison when I have seen the Holy Spirit literally take a spiritually dead man and make him alive. Do you see that? There is the supernatural nature of Christianity, but focus on what's truly supernatural and important. Now, he goes on and he says this. He says, For they will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Now, will they all know him to the extent that Jonathan Edwards or a Calvin or a Luther or somebody like that? No, I'm... I'm not even in their in their league. So what does this mean? Well, let's go on. It says. For they will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. They will enter into a relationship with him, knowing that he is the one true God, and they will have a keen awareness that by his hand he has cleansed them, freed them from their sin. There will not be the smack of self-righteousness there. They will not say, God and I have worked this out. They will have a keen awareness that God has taken care of their iniquity and he did it all by himself. Now, another thing, let's go on. Let, just jump over really quick to verse 38 of chapter 32. Again, they shall be my people and I will be their God. And look what he says. I will give them one heart. And one way. Have you ever seen these these marches for Jesus? The unity marches that they have in which all these different denominations come together and they're trying to prove to the world that there's unity between them when in fact there's very little <laughs> unity at all between them. And they're all marching together and singing Kumbaya and we're, we're proving to the world that we're one. That's not what Jesus meant. Okay? That's not what Jesus meant. You bring two Christians together. Two Christians. And although they may differ in some things, but you bring two Christians together and my friend you will find unity you will find spirit bearing witness with spirit you will find joy it is amazing I can sit down for example on an airplane in Zambia and sit down beside a person I have never met in my life and after a while pull out my Bible to kind of you know, hoping this guy say something to me like, what's that? Sometimes I pull out my Greek New Testament so they'll look at it and go, what's that? I can't read it very well, but it really makes a great witnessing tool. <laughs> no matter where I am in the Greek New Testament, I read John 3.16 when they ask me to read something to them. But I can sit down with someone I've never met and we start talking and discover that we are both believers in Jesus Christ, and I mean it is a party for the rest of the flight. We are one. People, there's so much disunity in the church. No, there's not. There's a lot of disunity with a bunch of carnal people who are goats trying to act like sheep. That's the problem. 
But when you bring believers together, there will be unity. Does it mean that there will never be disunity? No, it doesn't mean because there's sin in all of us. It doesn't mean there'll never be disunity. It doesn't mean that there'll never be disagreements. But it means when you look at the full course of the relationship, there is a fraternal love, a unity there. I remember one of the illustration that I, I just love to use on this I was traveling through the mountains years and years ago in a red zone that the communists, the Maoists controlled. And uh, we were lost and everything. It was pitch dark and we were scared. Another missionary and myself and and we made our way into this little village and I kind of stood on the edge of it. My brother that was with me was Peruvian and he went in and he came back out. He says, I don't see any military. So we kind of walked in and I kind of humped over so everyone would think I was short. <laughs> and uh, we came up to this drunk and we said, Ay, hermanos por aquí. are there brothers here? And he said, ah, la vieja por ahí, the, the old woman over there, she's one of you. And so I went over there and I knocked on the door. After a few minutes, the door kind of creaks open as a little mud adobe hut carved into the back of a, a cliff. And this little woman, she's about this big, she opened the door with her lantern and looked. And I said, somos hermanos, necesitamos ayuda. We're brothers. They, she knew what that meant in Spanish. We're, we're evangelicals. We're Christian. And we need help. And she went, I'll never forget that face. Or she went, and she just grabbed us and pulled us in. Took us down to the basement that they'd carved out of the side of the, the hill there. Put us down there. A little boy came. She gave him some instructions. All of a sudden, he took off. He comes back running and then this man shows up. He's got a, two chickens and another little poor farmer comes up with some yucca plant and they start preparing and we stayed there all night. All right, now, they were won to the Lord by a group of Nazarene missionaries. The Nazarenes and I could sit down and debate some issues. We We would. These were people who knew Christ and knew their sins had been forgiven. And because I was a preacher in Jesus' name, willing to risk their life. There's unity. There's unity. Now, theology is extremely important. It is extremely important. But I'll tell you this. I will not separate and break fellowship with someone who disagrees with me on some things. Now, I will separate with people who depart from historical Christianity, who preach another Christ and so on and so forth. But you see, there's a unity there. They knew Christ. They rejoiced in Him. That's what happens when you have the church and it's a church of people who have been converted, who have been regenerated by the Spirit of God. Will there be immaturity? Yes. Will there be problems? Live with me for a while. You'll get your answer. <laughs> but will people be able to see there's something different about this group of people and that something is their love. Jesus says they will know the world will know you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. Now. He says, I'll give them one heart. And one way. And then that they may fear me. Here's something about us as Christians. We can make a mess. But there is something that God has done to us. He has put his fear in our hearts. In, in a marriage relationship, my own, sometimes I will act like a jerk. Do you know what that word is? And and not want to acknowledge it. 
not want to say to my wife, I'm sorry. And I'll walk out there and I'll go into my office. Got a book to write. I got a sermon to prepare. And it's like the Lord's there. That's fine. You're going to be doing it on your own. <laughs> till you get this matter straight. Do you know what? There's a fear in me. There's a fear. There's an uneasiness, an unsettledness in my heart, a tremor. And I know I have got to go back and I have got to apologize and I have got to make this matter right. You see, you have a group of people who have been given new hearts and in that new heart, the law of God has been written. And not only the law of God has been written, but he has put his fear in us so that even when we have conflicts, disagreements and problems. It is the fear of the Lord that causes us once again to humble ourselves and to acknowledge. Our wrong and to work for restoration. That's a church. Now. I want us to go for a moment. Again, I said I would have to skip around. I want us to go to Matthew chapter 28. You know the Great Commission in verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Oh, this passage. Last month I spent like three weeks on all authority has been given unto me. Oh, man, it just it laid me on the floor. We have very little idea what that means. But I would encourage you to uh, read Daniel chapter 7 and Psalms chapter 2. Such authority has been given to him. He has so much authority that all the kings, all their actions and decrees are inconsequential. <laughs> they don't even matter. It's as though they didn't even exist. When his kingdom showed up, 2,000 years ago, everything else came to an end. Oh, he's allowing the kings and the nations to still play as though they had life and power. But they have none. He rules over all. <coughs> now, but it says this. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. I am so glad that he did not put here, go therefore and preach the gospel. You say, well, why, Brother Paul? I mean, you on YouTube, that's all you talk about. You only have one sermon. Because it is so easy. Now. Adolphe Monod, the, fra the famous French reformed pastor, he said, oh, the cross of preaching the cross, meaning that preaching the cross was such a burden because of its grandeur, because a preacher could never preach the cross as it ought to be preached. But but there is another sense in which the, pr the preaching of the gospel. Is a lot easier than making disciples. You see. If someone hears a preacher like me on YouTube or you see me preach right now. But you, you don't know me. All right, I know how to make sentences connect together. But do you really know me? Do you really know if I'm a godly man? You see, in preaching the gospel, I can preach and go. I can stand in front of people and boy, look like something very, very spiritual and then go and you never see my life. Do You see that? That's so easy. But he says, go and make disciples. And what does that mean? To make disciples, that means you are going, at least for a while, to imitate me as I imitate Christ, to follow me as I follow Christ. I am going to teach you, not only with my words, but I'm going to teach you as you watch me live 24 hours a day. That's tough. That's part of the work of the church. That's part of the work of the church. This has, you know, when when I first was a missionary in Peru, 
I just discipled, discipled and discipled. And it was tough because. People watched your life. But I'll tell you something that's been even more difficult. My three children. <laughs> to disciple them. Because, you know, they're, they're, they're just, they can, you know, Dad, you said this, why'd you do this? You see, it's so humbling, but it's so good. I would rather be crushed so that the hypocrisy would be torn out of me than to put on a mask and make everybody think I'm something I'm not. See, make disciples. It means that you live with people. You Touch people. You get involved in their life. I was evangelizing one day. Boy, did I have a rude awakening. I was out there, man. I was handing out tracts and I was preaching and people were throwing the tracts at me. And, and I saw this guy kind of look kind of a punk rocker guy and he took off kind of one direction. I walked up there and put a track on him. I said, here, this is a track of the gospel about Jesus. He turned around and he goes, you don't care about me. And he, I mean, it stopped me in my tracks. He goes, do you care enough about, about me to be my friend? To come to my house. To, to, to get to know me and my problems and my messed up life. Or are you just out here winning brownie points for God? Caring about people. That's why even be very, very careful in your evangelism. People can recognize just superficial. I want to just put another notch on my belt. Look at me. I am a preacher that everybody persecutes. It's not about you. To disciple people, you've got to enter into relationships with people. And to have a church, you are committing yourself to enter into a profound relationship with people. That's why one of our missionaries said, Brother Paul, we need to start a church in this area. I said, well, why, why do you feel like we need to start a church? We need to start a church here because if we start this church here, then we can start this church over here and we can use it as kind of a mother or a, 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 a seed bed to plant other churches over here. And I said, stop. You don't plant churches so that you can plant another church. You plant a church because you care about the people. And if you have any other idea about it, you end up using people to fulfill your vision. You see, church is, is, is for these people. These people. And I want you to think about some of the, the some of those. Some of the greatest writers among the reformers. The Puritans, the early Baptist, I want you to realize something. They never got on an airplane. They never traveled, some of them, outside of their country. Some of them even outside of their town. But as they pastored and their sermons, their writings, their life of pouring themselves into a flock... has been used to change the world. Adolphe Monod, the, the, the guy, I mean, he, he was so smart, his head must have been this big. He could do anything at the university. He could critical studies in Hebrew. Then they get him over here, critical studies in the New Testament. Then over here, history of the world. And I mean, just the guy could do everything. And, and they wanted him in the university so bad. And he said, no, I want to go pastor this little flock. And the book that he, that he wrote, Le'adu, The Farewell, are 19 sermons that he preached on his deathbed to his flock. And the last few sermons he laid on his back like this and could only look up at the ceiling because he couldn't even turn his head to look at the flock anymore. That book is priceless. Sometimes we want to do so much that we don't do anything. And sometimes we do so much and you can discern in there, man, you're all about creating a name for yourself. You're all about some great thing you're going to do. 
I, I was preaching last year in a place and, and people were coming from everywhere, but it really wasn't of the Lord. It was celebrityism and it stunk. And I walked over in the corner and the pastor came up to me and he said, Paul, maybe you just ought to go somewhere and die. That no one will hear your name again. And what he meant is, maybe you need to walk away from this entire circus and go pastor a little flock of people and just die there. And walk away from this mess. You see, here's what I want you to see. I am 47. I am not, I mean, I'm like, I'm not as old as these two guys here, but I'm, I'm getting older. <laughs> I'm not as old as him, but I'm getting older. I'm over the hill, and I, I figured out when you get over the hill, you start going down a lot faster. I'm getting older, and I don't want to waste my life. And what I see is that a lot of the big stuff and big plans and big ideas and everything we have about winning the world is nothing but flesh sometimes. Because we want to touch everybody, but we don't touch anybody. And so he says, make disciples. And then he says this, look at this. He says, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, observe all that I commanded you. Now think about this. He doesn't just say teach them. He says, teach them to obey what I've commanded you. You can't teach them to obey what God has commanded you unless you're obeying what God has commanded you. And so the church gives us an opportunity to live, to flesh this out, to live in obedience before other people and to be an influence with our life, with our lives. With our lives. And so the church. Is a community of people. Who have professed faith. In Jesus Christ. And confessed his lordship. And have come together. To worship him. But have also come together that they may mutually, might mutually encourage one another towards the goal of conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. <coughs> now, it's amazing. I was in Peru several years ago and a young American Marine, it was just a freak accident. He had his gun and he just turned, it went off and he shot himself in the head. And he laid there in the hospital, basically brain dead for three or four days before they pulled the plug. And I didn't know this, but I show up to try to witness to him. And there's these two Marines in full dress standing on each side of the door like this. And I, I, I asked somebody, what is this? And the Marine says, no Marine dies alone. Wow. Well, I started talking to somebody and I found out if a bunch of Marines are running... The first Marine arrives when the last Marine arrives. They arrive together. So if you're running first and this guy's last, don't think about crossing that line until you get him and bring him with you. We talk about an example of the Christian life. I'm growing. Yeah, well, what about your brother? What about your sister? In Christ. You see, without a church, we can't do any of this. We can't do any of this. You want to have a biblical church? Why do you want to have a biblical church? So that you can say you have a biblical church? Do you want to have a biblical church so that, you know, I mean, so that you can start a bunch of biblical churches? Or do you just want to honor God and love people? Whether anything happens or not. Now, he goes on, and I want us to show us um, 
I want us to go for a moment just to Ephesians 4. I want to talk about leadership for a moment. Chapter 4. Speaking of Christ, in verse 11, He gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, this is both a beautiful text and a very dangerous text. What do I mean? He's given gifted men to the church to do what? To equip the saints. But most of the time when this is preached, it is preached in a militant sort of way. What do I mean? It, it's preached to that, look, in our church, man, we got to get going. We got to get doing stuff. Look, I train you so that you can go out and do the ministry. And that ministry is winning people and making this church grow. And what am I doing? I'm turning this thing back again into a factory. Into a place where the saints come to labor. Do you see that? You're a worker. In the beehive. In the ant hill. We got to go. We got to grow. We got to build. We got to do. I train you. You go. That, p people have asked me several times today, how is it that some churches start out wanting to be biblical and then eventually they just kind of go the way of all other churches? These are the reasons. They turn church life into almost some kind of a, a factory. A work house now are we to do works of service we absolutely are to do works of service but i want you to look at this in a little bit different way he's given us gifted men for the equipping of the saints now the equipping of the saints just doesn't mean so that they can go out and work and bring in more people the equipping of the saints means also to prepare them to grow them to maturity. To help them be able to enter in strongly into a personal devotional life. Into a personal walk with Christ. It's not just about training them to go out to do something. It's training them so that they can be something. To be like Christ. And also this equipping is for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, of course, that includes evangelism. But I need to equip you not to just go out and, and, and win somebody and bring them in and they remain just as immature as the rest of us. I need to equip you to be able to minister to him. To minister to the body also. To help us grow into maturity. I need to equip husbands to do what? To minister to their wives. Need to equip fathers to do what? Minister to their children. Need to equip women to minister to their husbands and their children. You see, it's, you see how we'll just take a verse and automatically assume this is what it means? Get them all equipped so they can go out there and do a bunch of work. Get them equipped so that they can be like Christ, minister to one another, and witness to the world. But not in a machine, cog and wheel, factory sense of a beehive sort of thing. Or an anthill, where everyone goes out and gathers and comes back in. You see, again, look what we're talking about. Relationships. Loving one another, caring about one another, not so concerned about coming across the line first, but coming across the line with our other brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a church. Now. He goes on and he says. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, look, you can see. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, 
to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. To be a part of a church is to make a commitment to be biblically, practically concerned for the other people in that body that they might become everything that God desires for them to be. Now, let's go on. I want us to go now to 2 Timothy chapter 3. The church, its doctrine, its practices must be founded upon the Word of God. Now, he says here, that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. How does a person come to know the Lord? Through the sacred writings, through Scripture. But let me share with you, so we'll maybe talk about this tomorrow about evangelism, but I have seen recently People come to know the Lord not as a result of a one time encounter or witnessing through a track. I have seen people come to the Lord after eight months of Bible study. After eight months of the study in Scripture. My brother in law, John Green from England, is, is a great evangelist. He doesn't preach. Uh, he shouldn't preach. But as far as one on one dealing with people. And he just recently brought a guy to my office that he had been dealing with for about eight months. It's Bible study after Bible study, going through the scripture, going through the scripture. Listen to me. Preach on the streets. Yes. Witness to people tracks. Yes. Have you ever thought about entering into a relationship with some of these people? Inviting to meet them at a coffee shop once a week, twice a week, going through Scripture, studying Scripture. Not just hit and miss like a sniper with a rifle, giving them one shot to come to know the Lord, but maybe saying, I'm, I'm just going to pour my life into that person. And then he says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. When I was in seminary several years ago, my professor, he, uh, he, he stood in front of the class one day and he goes, shh, shh. I hear footsteps. Yeah. They're the footsteps steps of Aristotle walking through these halls. And they're louder than the footsteps of the apostles. And the point he was making was much of what we were doing had more to do with Greek philosophy than it did with the New Testament. Saying it was wrong. I want you to know something. Not only walking through church. But walking through your mind and your heart. Is psychology. Sociology. Anthropology. Doctrines. Of this age. And they will destroy you. We do not need to augment the scriptures with the social sciences in order to have a church. A church is founded upon the word of God and it needs no help from any outside source. I'll give you an example. If I were to teach on right now on the father's responsibility 
to be the primary educator in the life of his child, many of you would be going. Because that's not practiced here. Yeah. Or if I begin to teach on the biblical submission of the wife to the husband, some of you women would probably grow horns and claws and attack me right now. Because that's not practiced here. It's hated. It's despised. Years and years and years of training in all the dark arts you have received. You went to preschool. They did not teach you Psalms 1. They taught you the ways of the world. You went to grade school. They taught you all the doctrines of this age. You went to high school and they did the same. As a child, every time you turned on the television set, they taught you in a manner completely contrary to Christianity. And now you wonder why it's so difficult to live the Christian life. You see, there are things that Scripture teaches that if I taught them right now, maybe some of you would rise up in anger and just jump right through that window <laughs> or throw me through that window because you're, you, you can't even begin to address the issue because you have been taught the contrary over and over and over. Do not bring those sciences into the church because social sciences are not sciences by the pure definition of science. And do not bring something into the church whose major theories change about once every three years. We are to find, we are to found the church upon the scriptures and the church and the scriptures need no outside help. Let me give you a perfect example of this. You go to a Christian counselor who's also a psychologist and you say, I need some counseling. He goes, okay. You walk in and you say, now before we get started, I understand you're a Christian psychologist. What's your basis of authority? Now that is a proper question in debate, apologetics, secular philosophy. OK, what's the basis of your authority? I mean, you're going to start telling me things. What's the basis of your authority? And so you say, well, the Bible. I go, well, what are all these other books? Well, I um, I just, uh, you know, the truth of Scripture, but all truth is God's truth. So the truth we also find in these books are true, too. Well, I got a problem. What's your problem? Well, I see there Freud, Rogers, and Skinner. Three main guys in the West with regard to psychology. Yes. So? Well, Freud said that Rogers and Skinner were idiots. And Rogers and Skinner said that Freud was a pervert. And Skinner said Rogers didn't know what he's talking about. And everything Rogers wrote contradicted Skinner. So now here's my question. If all three of them contradict each other and all three of them contradict the Bible, who's the authority? And he goes, well, I choose, you know, the Bible, of course, is the authority. And then I choose out of these men what's true. So now you're the authority. Do you see the problem? There's one authority, and it's Scripture. If they speak not according to the law and the prophets, there's no light in them. There's no light in them. But it has become the religion of the age and one of the greatest hindrances to biblical church. A great hindrance. Now, I realize I may have made people mad, and I... If I did so by my attitude, I apologize. But what I said, I do not apologize for. It's true. Churches today are overrun with the ideas of anthropology, secular anthropology, secular psychology, and secular sociology. Now, don't think you're going to have a biblical church by purging 
that out of your evangelism. You got to purge it out of your marriage. Your idea of man. Your idea of truth. You got to purge it out of everything. God's word is true. And if something does not line up with God's word, it's not true. And it's not additional truth. You see, many of you, let me ask you a question. You would possibly say, yes, Brother Paul, I believe in the inspiration of Scripture. I am a conservative Christian. I believe in the inspiration of Scripture, that Scripture was God-breathed, that it is infallible, inerrant, that it is a faithful communication of God's truth. Okay, you believe in the inspiration of Scripture, you've only won half the battle. Here's the next question. But do you believe in the sufficiency of Scripture? Do you believe that the Scripture is sufficient to make the man of God adequate for every good work? Or does the man of God also need Freud, Skinner, Rogers, and everything else in order to counsel God's people, in order to teach God's people, in order to train God's people. You see, this is what Scripture is saying. This is what it is saying. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Every good work that needs to be done in the body, every good work, the Scripture can adequately prepare us for that. Everything, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, everything that we need for life and godliness has been granted to us. Everything we need to direct our marriages has been granted to us in this book. Everything we need to raise our children has been granted to us in this book. It is found there. It is. You have to make a decision. You want a biblical church or you want a halfway biblical church? There is no, like the philosopher said, what does Athens have to do? What does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? What does Christianity have to do with all these doctrines of the age that give no light and bring no blessing and kill all fruitfulness in the life of a person? Now, I want to go to one other thing and then we'll bring this to a close because I know I've gone on very long. Uh, let's just look for a moment at body life. I want us to go to uh, chapter 12 of the book of Romans. Verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has all allotted to each a measure of faith. Listen, as you grow in your Christian walk, you are going to come across true, honest believers that are not quite as mature, that are rather problematic. You need to constantly be asking yourself this question. What do I have that I have not received? And if I have received it, why do I boast? Who made you what you are? By God's grace, you have been saved. By God's grace, a work of sanctification continues in you. There is no room for boasting in the Christian life. And there is no room for comparison of setting one saint against another. I remember one time a woman who had done a great deal of damage, a great deal of damage with her wickedness in a church. And one morning she came... Uh, just running down the aisle. I was preaching and she was weeping and she just fell on the steps of the platform and she was crying out to God for forgiveness. And I looked up and I saw the faces of the people in that crowd. And I mean, they were like unbelieving, unforgiving. The woman had done some bad things. 
And I went down and I put my hand on her shoulder and I prayed for her. Afterwards, some people came up to me and they said, how could you touch that woman? And I said, because if she doesn't get forgiven, I have to go to hell too. You see the point? Mercy. You know, if, if you need evidence that we are not perfected at the moment of our conversion, if you need evidence of that, then just listen to this one statement by Jesus Christ. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Th that shames me, that verse. And I'll tell you why. A man like me, who has received such mercy, I have to be told to be merciful. I have to be reminded to be merciful after the mercy I've received, after the things I've done and been forgiven, I have to be reminded to be merciful. That's pathetic. And so body life is again built around humility. It's built around a mercy. It's built around thinking more of others. And he says, for just... As we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Now, the, in, in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, Paul deals with this in, in greater length. And I didn't want to go there because I didn't want to spend the entire night uh, having you just sitting here. Sometimes I look at my wife and, you know, men are really bad in, in that we begin to think at times that our wives are an extension of us and our children are an extension of us, you know. And we forget that they are persons in their own right. And there will be things between our wives and Christ that we know not of. But sometimes... I sit there and I, I try to remember this. She is God's daughter. Now, I don't know if any of you have daughters. If I have a little daughter. I don't know where my Christianity would go if somebody tried to hurt her. But I would do everything in my power to stop them. I mean, it, it, if you really don't want to be my friend and do something bad to my daughter. I mean, I, I can't even imagine someone would have to restrain me if somebody did something to my daughter. And I always try to remember my wife in that context with her father. She is God's daughter. I'm going to mess with her. I'm going to hurt her. If I, being evil, can love my daughter so much that I'd throw myself in front of a train for or fight any man on the face of the earth at least for two seconds before he knocked me out, <laughs> am I going to suppose that I want to deal with God in that way, treating harshly his daughter? Now let's take that farther. See, C.S. Lewis said this one time. Now I can't quote him directly, but he said, there, basically, he, he said this, there, there are no common people. Every person you meet will either be one day a monster in the bowels of hell or will be a creature so splendid and glorious that if you could see them now in that future state, you would fall down on your face and have a tendency to worship them. All right, now I want you to think that about your brother in Christ for a moment, your sister in Christ. Don't deal with this person in a harsh manner. Realize what they are. Realize what has been paid for them. Realize what they are going to become. Realize the relationship they have with God and you'll begin to treat them differently. You see that? They're not just some common little believer who attends church. 
They are God's. And one day they will be more glorious than anyone could even imagine. That's church. He goes on. He says that we are members. I am told that I am one with my wife and that only an insane man tears at his own flesh. Only a, an insane man practices self-mutilation. I mean, we all know that. And you see a man on the side of the street, you know, and he's ripping his arm off. You don't say, hey, how's, how's it going? I mean, you say, that is a very problemed person. All right, now, to attack my wife is insanity. The worst form. To rip at her. Brother and sister in Christ, same thing. Members. Members. And just remember this. You're not just ripping at one of your members. You're ripping at one of Christ's members. Part of His body. The church in Corinth was sternly warned that anyone destroys the body, God will destroy them. You see... You need to have a heightened view of God. You've heard that over and over. We need to have a heightened view of God. That's true. Do you know what else though? You need to have a heightened view of other believers. Of what they are. What they will be. What was paid for them. And we're members. Now, um, gosh, I can do this in America, but here in Europe, you guys are a lot more civilized <laughs> but i'm going to do this anyways let's see who's got tennis shoes on who who wants to volunteer who is really brave is anybody brave? you don't need tennis shoes you can do it in socks okay stand up and and really gosh if i'm out of line just realize i'm an american i'm from the south i have no culture okay <laughs> now i want you to run over to that rail as fast as you can, and then run back. As fast as you can. Go. Whoa, I should have got tennis shoes on him. He almost went out the window. Okay. Now, I want you to grab one foot like this, and I want you to run over there. Halfway and then come back. Halfway. Yeah, just halfway. We don't want you going out the window. Okay. Slower. Right? All right. Now, grab this foot like this. And grab the other one and pull it back. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Now, look. I removed one member, and he could not move as fast, as quickly, and definitely wasn't as graceful. I removed one member. I removed two members, and I incapacitated him completely. He couldn't even walk. Now, do you think every member in the body of Christ is important? This is not only an encouragement for every saint to come to understand their giftedness and their part in the body of Christ, but it is also necessary for us to appreciate every saint and to encourage them to be a part of the body because we need them. Now, if you tell saints, look, we need you... To, to just, you know, we need you to minister according to your gifts. We need you to be a part of this body because, man, we're out to do this. Again, that's mechanical. We just want you to be part of the factory. But if you say, we need you in this body to minister to your gifts because we as a body need you. We need you. We need your giftedness. We need what God's done in your life. We need you as a person. We need you. That's church. See? That's church. That we're members of one another. And then he goes on and he says this. I want to just run down to nine because of the lack of time. It says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another. So you want to have a church? Are you willing to be devoted to one another? 
I'm not talking about showing up on Sunday, listening to a sermon and running away. I'm talking about actually entering into relationships. You see, Christianity, especially now in, in reform circles in, in many ways, um, has become like almost going to the theater. People got their favorite preacher and their favorite worship. And so they go in and they take their seat in the church. We ought to get a thing with a popcorn holder and, and a place where you can put your Coke to watch your favorite preacher, to watch your favorite worship guy, and then to say goodbye. And the best part is it's free. Unless you're in a Baptist church, then they make you pay a tithe. <laughs> it's free. That's not church. I hear ministers say all the time, the Bible says you shall not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And what he's saying is, listen, you need to come hear me preach. But what it's saying is you don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together so that you can minister to one another, exhort one another, encourage one another. That is why at least... There's less obstacles in doing this sort of thing in a small fellowship. And if the fellowship grows larger to either some of the members that are in that fellowship that are from a certain part of town, send them over there to start another church or at least break this thing up in some sort of house churches and things like that so that you can actually get involved in ministering to one another. Another thing that's very important, I was preaching down in a, a place in Alabama a few weeks ago to a group of people in Tharptown, Alabama. And I just love these people. They're just wonderful. And uh, I was preaching, and uh, it was going a little bit long. I know you can't believe that, but it was going a little bit long. <laughs> and I said, now stop that. And they all kind of looked up. I said, I know what you're thinking. You're all thinking about leaving here and going to El Rancho. El Rancho is the favorite, most favorite Mexican restaurant there near the church. Uh, matter of fact, it's the only restaurant in the whole entire town. So um, I said, I know what you're doing. You're not thinking about church anymore. You think about going to El Rancho. And they were like, you know, they're all feeling guilty. But I said that because I wanted to teach them something. I said, now stop. Ask yourself right now. Are you doing church? Or whatever you call Are you doing church? No. I said, I want you to look at something a little bit different. Right now, you're sitting under the preaching of the Word of God. We have worshipped collectively and we have prayed collectively. Now, you think you've done something spiritual and then you're going to leave and you're going to go to El Rancho and, and do something not so spiritual. I said, actually, the way you need to look at it is you're leaving here to go to church. I'm like, well, what do you mean? I said, now if you go there and talk about your favorite football team or something, not necessarily. I said, but do you realize you're not talking to each other right now? You're not ministering to one another? You're listening to a sermon, which is necessary. You've worshipped collectively and prayed collectively, which is all necessary and good and it's part of church. But what do you say now that as soon as I dismiss this, we all go over to El Rancho and have church. We go over there. Sit down at a table. With a fellow believer. Talk to them. Get to know them. Find out what's going on in their life. Eat some chips. God's good. And just get to know one another. To love one another. To bless one another. You see, their whole idea of church revolved around coming into that place, worshiping collectively, listening to a Bible study, and then leaving. That's not church. That's a very essential part of church. But see, there you go again, just identifying it with a service, a meeting, a meeting place. It is you collectively caring for one another. There was a pastor down in Argentina, and he had grown the church to about... 600. And that's the language he used, he said, because I had grown the church to 600. And he said, I, I was miserable. He said, finally, I, I came under such, I didn't even know why, I was just, 
knew something was wrong, knew something was terribly wrong. So he set aside time for prayer and fasting and studying the Scriptures. And it just seemed that the Lord impressed upon his heart through the study of Scripture that everything he had built was just hay, wood, and stubble. That he needed to start again. He's a really personable guy, really great speaker, knew how to do things. And I mean, people were coming to that church in the droves. And God was saying, so this is what he did. The next Sunday, uh, you know, they got the big worship service and everything. And the music director goes, and now Pastor Ortiz, let's say, is going to come and give us the word of God. And he got up and he walked over there and he goes. Uh, love one another. As Jesus loved you. And he sat down. The music director hopped up, said, we'll have another song now before the main sermon. So he sings another song and then now our pastor will come. And he goes, no, really. Love one another. As Christ loved you. He did that. He said he did that for six weeks. And he said on the sixth week, two of the deacons sitting in the front pew, one in the front pew, the other one in the second pew, the one in the front pew turned around. And he said, as soon as I got through saying, love one another, the deacon turned around and goes, hey, I think I know what he's trying to tell us. And what happened was they started serving one another, caring for one another. They, men started, the Spirit of God began to work. Men started, uh, the deacons started searching out the widows in the church who were, who were alone. I mean, just all kinds of things. Do you see? It's church. That's church. Now, he says, he, he goes on and be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Boy, we are not a people who know much about honor. In America, we pride ourselves. We don't have a king and we're never going to have a king. And I don't care who you think you are. I'm just as good as you are. That's our mentality. Independent spirit. I bow my head to no one. That's not Christian. He says, give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Look, but this lagging behind. Look what it's in. Don't lag behind in being devoted to one another. Don't lag behind in giving preference to one another. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer for your brothers and sisters in Christ, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Do you do that? Do you practice hospitality? Invite people into your home? Feed them? Call over other believers. Hey, come on over to my house tomorrow. I'm going to put a pot of stew on and we'll just talk about the Lord. Do you open your home? Do you know that's one of the qualifications of an elder? He has to be hospitable. He has to open up his home. And if he doesn't, he doesn't qualify. I don't care if he's the best teacher on the face of the earth. You see? You can say, oh, we can look past that because, man, he is a great Bible teacher. No, you can't. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, I want you to just think about this for a moment. A guy says, I'll put this in the context of marriage. A guy says, I can't love my wife. He, he says, he's a Christian. He's in the church. He comes to the pastor. He says, I can't love my wife. Okay? You can't love her as a wife. No? Um... Can you love her as a fellow believer? No. Can you love her as a lost person? No. 
Can you love her as an enemy who persecutes you and curses you? No, Christ has commanded you to love her in all those ways. So you're not just called to love your brother. You're called to love your enemy who persecutes you and curses you and wants your eternal condemnation. So if you're called to love that guy, most certainly you can love your brother. Do you see that? Do you know, honestly, what what my goal is in life? I mean, I've, I kind of have a little I figured I wasn't going to get every, you know, I wasn't going to be able to accomplish everything. So I thought I'm going to set out one goal. But it's kind of an all encompassing goal. <coughs> if I can grow. In my love. Toward my wife. If I can manifest Christ like love toward her. That's my goal. And you say, well, that's kind of puny. Obviously, you're not a husband. But look at this. If I can love the person. With whom I have the closest most intimate relationship. She's seeing all my flaws and I having to bear with all of hers. Then love's not going to be a problem with everybody else, is it? I am so tired. I told someone, they said, why are you going to plant a church somewhere? I said, I'm tired of preaching Christianity. I want to go live it somewhere. I want to go live it somewhere. You know, guys, if, if, if this is a church and if 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 this isn't your goal, then what you're going to do is you're going to go out and bring in people and make them two full sons of hell like yourself. But this goal is to be like Christ. And to follow him. That's a church. A group of people. Devoted to Christ. Devoted to one another. That's it. So you can have all those other things. And elders and. Everything else. But if you don't have this. Then you don't have a church. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand and to apply these truths, to be transformed by them. In Jesus' name, amen.